Some people recover more quickly from concussions than others. I'm Joe Lamb and this is Joe Knows Brains. Today we're going to discuss um, kind of the issues going on that, that can affect someone's recovery from a concussion, the, the pre-existing conditions, if you will, that, that can make people recover more quickly from concussions and, and, and why some people seem to recover quickly and have no adverse consequences and some people continue to have what's known as these post-concussive syndrome issues that, that we've talked about in other videos. Um, the main issues I'm going to be talking about today are, are kind of the, uh, the pre-existing psychological disorders that, and the effect those have on recovery from concussions. The second is going to be age and other risk factors that, that affect recovery from concussions. And then last, uh, I'm going to talk about two new theories. Well, it's essentially one theory, with, which is a discussion as to the brain's passive and active reserve capacities. First, turning to um, kind of how... Um, certain mental conditions can affect someone's recovery from a concussion. Research is beginning to show that people with pre-existing depression, ADHD, and, um, and similar conditions, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, tend to be a little bit more vulnerable to concussion sy symptoms. Um, unfortunately, in my own practice, I've seen this. Um, quite often, people who have a, a mild case of, and, and that's, and I apologize, I'm not a psychiatrist, so at, in no way do I mean to call one case of case mild and another case more serious, but um, very often people will report mild depression symptoms, you know, saying that it's something that they had treated with in the past, but, but wasn't something that was a serious issue of their life. And then following a brain injury, um, these symptoms seem to be seriously aggravated. Um, and, and sometimes that condition can be permanent. Um, research is beginning to show that, that the statistics do back that up, um, that, that these types of conditions can be more seriously aggravated by a brain injury. And, and, and part of that may be to do with what I'm going to talk about later in the video, which is this active versus passive um, clinical reserve capacity that the brain has. But in, in terms of these situations, from a lawyer's perspective, it can be very difficult to prove, uh, especially objectively, an increase in symptoms similar to this. When you have, for example, someone who's treating therapeutically for one of these conditions, how does one prove that, you know, before they were depressed, but now their depression is seriously interfering with their life? And this is something that a, a an experienced brain injury attorney can really help with because there's quite a few different objective tests that can be used to um, describe the subjective outcomes that are occurring. Um, in addition, Another concern that, that anyone who has a brain injury has is it, we have to look at the age of the individual. Unfortunately, for those who are over the age of 40, it just seems that a brain injury can be more severe and, and less um, likely to be recovered from. The, the statistics show in the objective findings that, that older individuals, both for their bodies and their brains, have less of a uh, ability to recover from, from an injury. And, and this is unfortunate, but not, not unsurprising. Um, if someone's in their 70s versus someone in their 20s and they were to break their arm, for example, it's well established that it's going to take that person in their 70s a lot longer to recover the arm injury than it's going to take for someone in their 20s. Similar to going to the gym, everyone, as they get older, reports, you know, the more often I go as I get older, the, the recovery process is slower. Um, and this is simply just uh, carries forward into brain injuries as well. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is, is this new concept of, of reserve capacity and there's two types of reserve capacity there's there's passive reserve and then there's active reserve capacity what this means is is that the theory espouses that that someone's passive reserve capacity is based on the actual neuronal connections that exist within the brain that means that all of us have a certain number of neurons that for one reason or another our brain has allowed to be injured and and we're still going to be okay um, we're going to stay above that threshold Unfortunately, um, this passive threshold isn't really something that, that you or I can change. It has to do with, um, with the actual neuronal connections in the brain. Um, and, then, and, and what it really is, is there's a critical threshold after which you begin sustaining brain damage. Um, the theory behind this is that um, as, as animals, our brains evolved to um, ha have a certain degree of capacity that you know, you take it one hit or another because we're going to be hunting in the wild um, and you, you still need that brain to function at full capacity. And then over time, because our bodies aren't designed to last forever, it begins to slowly degrade. Um, the, the other concept of reserve capacity is what's known as active reserve capacity. 
And this is something that, um, for the theory, can actually be increased and changed. Active capacity is something that you can change by learning a new language, learning a musical instrument, or um, any other form of education. Um, life experiences have also been shown to potentially increase this active reserve capacity. What it means is, is that the more we learn, the more axonal connections our brain makes. And following one brain injury, we, we find that um, the brain makes active progress to try and overcome the, the damage that has occurred. This is why, as we talked about in other videos, one of the worst things that can happen after one brain injury is having a pretty recent subsequent brain injury. In fact, it's well established that a back, the back-to-back -back brain injuries are significantly more serious than the sum of their parts. Um, turning back to this concept of reserve, basically the, the theory is, is that once you breach this reserve capacity, um, you begin seeing brain damage. Um, some of the theories behind this emerged from the CTE research from the NFL in the late or the early uh, 2010s, uh, where they began to be found that not only is it concussive impacts that are seriously affecting brains, it's continuous subconcussive impacts or uh, that was developing into the the CTE that has become such a uh, prominent element of discussions these days. So really, at the end of the day. Um, everyone's going to be affected by a concussion differently. Um, well, the factors that affect that are age, they're going to be um, any pre-existing conditions, general men mental and physical well-being, the same as any other injury. And, and, and the, the more research comes out, the more we decide that, or the more we begin to see that there may be certain elements of passive and active capacity that can affect our ability to sustain a brain injury and, um, and continue on. This is important because the more we learn about these things, the more we may know how to handle people's decision making in the future so they can avoid seriously injuring themselves more so than maybe they will for the first time. It's going to be really hard to stop every concussion, but maybe we can stop um, some of these repeat concussions and, and we can really help find more safety measures for those people who are more at risk for the long term symptoms. All of this information, like so many of my other topics, is in our guide, the Layman's Guide to Brain Injuries. Um, it's, it's written in plain English so everyone can understand. You can get a free copy at the link below. Um, thank you guys so much for your time, um, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.